Good morning. Good to see everyone here today. It's nice to welcome my sister and her husband, Jan and Alan Patterson. It's not the same last name. Oh, it's been a while since I've actually clapped for you. Uh, it is nice. Alan's here teaching the whole semester, the fall semester, uh, on the subject of missions. If you're interested in that subject, let me encourage you to take the class. You can uh, audit it, or if you're actually in college, you can take it for credit. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, taught from the standpoint of the Word of God, especially... But uh, Alan and Jan were in Japan for it was 18 years, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so it's a blessing having them here. Uh, since that time, he came back from Japan to work with our mission board, Gospel Fellowship Association Mission. And I've been with that board going on 40 years now, some, somewhere close to that. I'm not sure exactly how close, but... Uh, it's very good to have them here, and uh, let me encourage you to plan next August, September. I don't know if it's always going to be in September, but uh, Foundation Baptist Church sponsors a, an adult theology conference. It's called that because they didn't want to call it a singles theology conference, and uh, so uh, Brother Logan and I were there uh, Thursday and Friday, a real blessing, tremendous messages, actually from the director of the um, uh, mission organization, which I've been with for these 40 years, uh, Brother John Crocker, and it's a blessing um, listening to them. It was a, a blessing visiting to a lot of the folks that I spent a lot of years with down there at Foundation Baptist Church but it's good to be here with you. I told somebody recently my favorite time of the uh, week is to be here with you and opening God's Word together. That's a blessing. Uh, turn to chapter 21 in the book of Acts. That's where we'll begin. Sometimes in our reading of Scripture... We are troubled by what is not said in the text, or we'll tr we're troubled by the things we read that are not said not to be. And uh, for example, uh, sometimes they can be a blessing. For example, when you read about heaven in the book of Revelation, we are told several things that are not going to be in heaven. Um, there will be no tears. In fact, God's going to wipe away all tears, it says, himself. So no mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, no crying, no pain, no death. Death shall be no more, so no funerals in heaven. No temple for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no sun or moon there. And I know there are things you read about not being there. You know, I grew up on the ocean. And when I first heard that there's not going to be any sea, S-E-A, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't stop me from wanting to be there. I'll just be pleased with whatever is there. There'll be no sun or moon for the glory of God gives it light and there will be no night there. Part of what makes heaven heaven is what is not there. And the nice thing, one of the nice things about being a Christian is that when someone you love passes away and goes to heaven, there is great, great comfort. It is what unsaved people miss. They hope they're okay, but they cannot know. 
if they don't know Christ. And coming to something that's not there in Acts chapter 21, there were two things that bothered me that weren't mentioned there. And it's not that they were mentioned, it's that they weren't. Luke says nothing about Paul, why Paul went to Jerusalem in the first place. Uh, half of his third missionary journey was taken up with collecting an offering from the Gentile churches to give to the impoverished Jewish converts in Jerusalem. And nowhere, when they arrive in Jerusalem or after he's there, nowhere does it mention that uh, they were so pleased to give this offering to them. Um, and you think what a blessing it would be for the Holy Spirit to burden uh, Luke's heart, who's the author of the book of Acts, and uh, for the Spirit of God to tell him uh, what a great thing this was that these two ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles, in Christ could work together for the needs of both sides of this. Or that there was inter-church cooperation uh, in one group providing what was needed by the other group. And uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, right now there was nothing there. And I thought, why doesn't why didn't the Spirit of God mention it there? And the second thing, we read back in Acts chapter 20, verse 16, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus on his way down to Jerusalem so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. And why didn't he want to do that? Asia's not a bad place, but he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now... They had already been in Philippi. Paul and Luke were in Philippi, not only for the Passover, which is in uh, sometime in March or early April, but they have the Feast of Unleavened Bread right after that. And they celebrated those two feasts back to back with the Philippian church. Then they met with the other folks in their missionary band and uh, headed south. He was hurrying to Jerusalem. Well... There's nothing about when they arrive, they go to the Feast of Pentecost in uh, late May or early June. Uh, did they make it? Why does the Spirit of God leave that out? Maybe just to make us readers think. I wonder if they did. And, uh, but there's something that we need to remember when we have questions like this. What do I do with the things that the Bible does not say that I wish they said? Well, what I do with them is I leave them in the mind and heart of God. Because it's not going to do me any good to worry about it. It's certainly not going to do me to read what uh, Dr. Smellfunkus or Dr. Highbrow thinks about what happened with this not being mentioned. You know, this is up to God. And I trust him with the things that I don't know because God does not say. And uh, the secret things belong to the Lord. What do I do with those secret things? They belong to the Lord. The Lord doesn't owe me an explanation for what he does. He is not answerable to us. He is the one we are answerable to. So it's very comfortable to leave them in the heart of God. If you reveal these things to me, that's fine. That's a blessing. But Lord, I know that you tell me what I need from the scriptures. Now our message this morning is going to trace the travels of this missionary band. You say, why do you call them a band? You'll find out in a minute from Miletus, which was the port city of Ephesus, where Paul did not want to stay too long. Uh, it's the port city where the, their boat stopped, and they called for the elders to come downriver to Miletus uh, 
And last week we looked at Paul's charge to these elders from Ephesus. And we find out that when he had finished giving them their charge, he and the others got on board the ship that they came in and they continued heading south. So there are three stages of their trip. First one is Miletus to Tyre in verses 1 through 6. And for each one of these stages, I picked a phrase out of the passage to characterize something about that particular stay in the place where they got and stayed a period of time. And so from Miletus to Tyre, when they got to Tyre, the phrase that's mentioned there that we're going to focus our attention on a little bit is, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. They were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. The second stage from Tyre to Caesarea, uh, and that's verses 7 through 14. That'll be our second point. The phrase that I picked out of there is that the people urged him, and that's Paul, not to go. Notice the pattern there. (laughs) Don't keep going south. Don't go to Jerusalem. And then the third stage from Caesarea, just 120 kilometers walk from the coastal town of Caesarea to the city of Jerusalem. And that's verses 15 through 26. And the phrase that I want to focus on there is Paul went into the temple. And we can add in parentheses, and that's where the trouble started. Everything was okay until then. Well, let's take the first one, Miletus to Tyre, verses 1 through 6. But before we start into that text, I want to begin by reminding us of what Paul decided the Lord wanted him to do way back in Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. You don't need to turn back there, but this is when he was in Ephesus And uh, verse 21 says, now after these events, that is, after the extraordinary miracles. You remember that? Just a cloth touched the apostle, and they would take the cloth to someone who was ill, sometimes a long distance away. But as soon as the cloth touched the ill person, bang, that person was healed. Extraordinary miracles, they were called in the text. And then after that, you remember the seven sons of Siva? Not so extraordinary. It was pretty extraordinary that the demon beat all seven of them up and ran them out of the place, but not uh, in comparison to what God was doing through the apostle. And then the last thing in the chapter that was one of the things that had happened was enough of the believers in Ephesus gathered what they had collected, magic books, books that helped them to know how to perform magic, and they burned them all because they were followers of Christ and they were not going to have the remnants of a worldly, ungodly life in their possession any longer. They didn't sell them. They burned them. And uh, Luke says the price of those was... Uh, Some 50,000 silver coins. So just remarkable. After these things, after these events, um, Paul resolved in the Spirit. So the Spirit of God was leading him. And this is why I had uh, Pastor Logan read that passage. We saw Paul wanted to go here. The Spirit said, no, not there. Paul said, okay, but what about here? The Spirit of God said, no, not there. And so Paul goes to Troas and he says, well, what am I supposed to do? And then he has a God-given vision to tell them what to do. It's interesting where it says that they concluded that God wanted them to cross the North Aegean and to be in the city of Philippi and uh, 
preach the gospel there. Because that little phrase, conclude, is what the closing argument that a lawyer uses in presenting his case. Uh, There's the uh, barrister for the prosecution and the barrister for the defense. And when each of them finishes their presentation, offering all their evidence, they give a concluding statement. This is what we want you to decide. And it's the same word. The Holy Spirit says, I'm going to show you the way, and I want you to follow this. And they did. Remarkable thing. And then those, uh, uh, so here's what happened. Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and then go to Jerusalem. Paul resolved in the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, I just want to ask a question, and we're on we'll go. Does this verse tell us that Paul is convinced that God wants him to go to Jerusalem? Does it tell us that, yes or no? Yes, it does very clearly. And it's not just Paul resolving to go. He is resolving because the Spirit of God is burdening him for that. And so when he gets to Miletus and all the elders are there in Acts chapter 20, he tells them, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. He's saying, my hands are tied. I can't do anything else. If I'm going to obey God, I am going to have to go to Jerusalem. And then he explains to them, I don't know what's going to happen when I get there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. And it's true. You read the book of Acts. Has he ever been afflicted in the service of the Lord before? (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, A lot. In fact, you could make a whole appendix to the book of Acts on the sufferings endured by the Apostle Paul in serving the Lord. But notice what he says in answer to that. The Spirit says to me, I'm going to face afflictions wherever I go. But, verse 24, I do not account my life of any value. My life is of no value to me unless I do one thing. And then he says in the next phrase, nor do I count as precious my life to myself, if only I may finish my course. God has given me a path to walk, a course to run, and my whole reason for living is to finish that course. And what is that course? The ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now, one question. Does this verse tell us that Paul is convinced that God wants him to go to Jerusalem? I don't hear. I hear kids, but they're not saying yes or no. Yes. Yes, very clear. So now we come to Luke 21. This is our passage for this morning. Beginning in the first three verses, Luke describes the course that Paul and his group of nine... Now you say, where did all these other people come from? They are mentioned as the ones who have helped collect the offering for the Jews in Jerusalem... And he names them, and I won't give you where they're from. You can look it up in chapter 20 and verse 4. But a guy named Sopater and Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus. Now, you you want to remember Trophimus' name because he's going to come up. And you need to come back next week to see how he comes up. Uh, So off they go, all of these, and of course, that's only seven. If you're counting, you're going, hey, wait a minute. Yes, I did. And uh, that's because after the Passover and unleavened bread, Paul and Luke join the other seven. So now there's a group of nine uh, 
and they're on their way to Jerusalem, all of them. Now, you know, you can't go to Jerusalem and say, here's my credit card, just put it all on my card and send all the money that comes from that to these impoverished Jews here. They're carrying cash, coins. And uh, the best way to carry coins is with a lot of people, especially if you can have a servant that's about 6'5 and 300 pounds and Anybody wants to think about stealing some of that money has to go through your servant. So, so they're taking the money down to uh, Jerusalem, and uh, uh, it says there that they sailed away southward from Miletus, and when they had parted from the Ephesian elders, they set sail. We came by a straight course to Kos. Kos is an interesting island. Why? Well, because a guy named Hippocrates set up his first medical school there. Who's Hippocrates? Well, medical graduates have to take an oath called the Hippocratic Oath to save life. And that dates back to Kos and to Hippocrates. And the next day they came to Rhodes, the city on the island, and from there to Patera, near the southern extreme of Asia, which is modern Turkey. Turkey. So if you look at a map of Turkey, way down in the south, they had to leave the boat they were on, and they found a ship crossing to Phoenicia. And uh, notice the author says, we went. That's how we know Luke was there. We, us, he was traveling with them at this time. So you see that in your text, and you know that Luke was with them. And they said, when we had come in sight of Cyprus, Patera is uh, on the bottom end of Asia. They found a boat that kind of went down around Cyprus and along the southern shore of Cyprus to Phoenicia in what we would call Syria today, where Tyre and Sidon uh, are, the cities, for there was a ship that was going there to unload its cargo. So they, they sailed south of Cyprus, they sailed to Syria, landed in Tyre, which is uh, uh, north of Ptolemais, the next little town they're going to, and then uh, north also of Caesarea. So verse 4 says, when they arrived in Tyre, they knew about the church family that was there, but they didn't know who they were, So it says they went searching for them, uh, and having sought out the disciples, they had to look for them. He says, we stayed there, uh, Luke and those with him, for seven days. And this was the first thing that made me think, why are they waiting there seven days? Aren't they in a hurry to get back? Um, Well, might have been because... There was no ship to take them, or the ship was unloading its cargo and loading other cargo. We don't know the reasons, and that's okay that we don't. Um, And notice what the second half of verse 4 says. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think that means and explain why. I think what that means is um, the Spirit was revealing to these folks, perhaps through someone with the prophetic gift, we don't know, the affliction that Paul would face in Jerusalem and in response to that revelation that you're going to face real difficulty in Jerusalem when you go there, the disciples respond to that by telling Paul not to go. Now the problem with that interpretation is this. It doesn't sound like that's what it's saying. (laughs) It sounds like the Holy Spirit is telling him not to go. You say, yeah, but, you know, is there an answer in translation? Is is it translated badly here? And the answer is no. It's translated very accurately. Now, I have two reasons not to assume 
that the Holy Spirit is telling them not to go to Jerusalem. Even though that's what it sounds like is happening. Actually, I have more reasons than that. And the further we go, the more you will agree that what's happening is the Holy Spirit is saying you will face difficulty there. But not that he's saying, I don't want you to go there anymore. What are my reasons? Number one, I have two verses we've already seen in which the Holy Spirit says very plainly for Paul to go. And one of the things we learn about God in the Word of God is that he does not change his mind. He is not a man that he should repent or the son of man or not a man that he should lie. Or change his mind. Not a man that he should repent. Uh, not the son of man that he should repent. So there is this theme in scripture that the, the direction of the Lord is the direction of God. And he doesn't change his mind. The second thing, when I see the results of Paul going, I have to admit it must be God's will. For him to go. Now, as we come along to the other reasons, in addition to these, uh, we'll see that this really is what uh, God is saying. The Holy Spirit is telling Paul, You're going to face difficulty there, but that does not mean that I don't want you to go. All right? Why would the Spirit reveal to Paul's coming uh, to Jerusalem? He's going to have to face affliction. It may be intended to prepare Paul for the reality of his upcoming suffering in Jerusalem. You know, I remember years ago, I was reading a biography about uh, Jonathan Goforth and his wife. And after they had been back in Canada for a furlough, uh, they got on a ship this early 1900s, no planes, <laughs> They got on a ship and they were going back and he and his wife were standing by the railing of the ship just looking out at a beautiful sunset, I think. That's what it was. And uh, they said something to the effect, I wonder what we're going to face. And Jonathan Goforth wrote in the, uh, a letter or part of his uh, autobiography or wherever it's found, he said, if I had known or if we had known what we were going to face, we would not have gone back. They would have been afraid of everything they would have faced. So God did not reveal it to them. But apparently, for whatever reason, God revealed it to Paul. So Paul is determined to continue following the Spirit's leading to Jerusalem. That's one way I know that this is the right interpretation. Because Paul's determined to go. He doesn't stop. He doesn't say, well, you know, we didn't come very far. We're in Tyre. We can go back pretty easily to Ephesus or wherever uh, we want to go. No. Nope. Uh, Paul's departure with the other eight is described in verses 5 and 6. When our days there were ended, the boat was ready to go. It's going south to Ptolemais. It said, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, that is the believers that they found and that they stayed with for seven days, with wives and children, all these believers accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. And then we went on board the ship and they returned Home. So think of Paul. He's on the boat and they're sailing southward. Ephesus is the first test of Paul's resolve to follow the Lord's will and uh, to go to Jerusalem. Miletus is the second of these tests. And now Tyre is the third of these tests. But here goes the boat. Which direction? South. Headed toward Jerusalem. Why? I really believe God wants me there. 
So from Tyre to Caesarea, our second point, verses 7 through 14, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived in Ptolemais. Ptolemais is the modern remains. There's no city there. The remains or the archaeological uh, 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 discoveries that were made there, it's called Acre, A-C-R-E, uh, and uh, they come there. That's where the Roman city of Ptolemais was, the name was changed and they built a city there. We greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. And on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea. The first day, about 50 kilometers. In a sailing vessel, you can do that very quickly. The next day, maybe they had to stop in Ptolemais and uh, uh, take cargo off, maybe put other cargo on. So the next day they're on their way to Caesarea. That was the main Roman port in the um, land of Canaan. Uh, and uh, so they stop at Ptolemais. They greeted the brothers and stayed with them one day in Acre. And then the next day they came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip the Evangelist who was one of the seven, one of the seven what's? Deacons, right, back in Acts chapter 6. Philip was mentioned as one of the deacons, and here he is with the gift of evangelism, and he uh, is one of the seven, and uh, they stayed with him. And then in verse 9, Luke says something really interesting. It's interesting because it's not attached to anything except Philip was their dad. Verse 9 says he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And prophecy in the book of Acts deals with predicting future events. And we're going to see that happen here. But not from the four daughters. So I didn't think women were supposed to be preachers or predictors. Well, back in Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching at Pentecost, he says... Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy when the Spirit comes. But this is, in fact, the only example of women preaching in the book of Acts. And so we won't deal with that extensively. But, but what I do want you to notice is verse 10. While we were staying for many days... That's the second phrase that made me think, why aren't they hurrying anymore? Many days they're staying there. A prophet named Agabus, who was a man, came down from Judea. In other words, not the four daughters were used by the Holy Spirit, but Agabus. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt or the sash that he wrapped around and knotted around his waist and bound his own, that is, Agabus bound himself, his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, now think with me back to the Gospels. When the Jews handed Jesus Christ over to the Gentiles, he's talking about the Romans, what did the Romans do to Christ? They crucified him. So, so that's what Agabus is saying. He's going to be delivered into the hands of the Romans. And so the people know that's what happened with Jesus. Is, is this going to be Paul's death? And so look what they say. Um, uh, the Spirit is revealing what is going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem. And by the way, this is another proof that that's what the Spirit did back in Tyre. So the Spirit reveals through Agabus that this is what Paul is going to face. And um, uh, this is the second prediction of difficulty. But it is, again, it's not God's prohibition of Paul going there. What is the reaction of Paul's fellow travelers? Verse 12, when he heard, or when we, Luke is saying, when we, Luke and the other uh, eight, or the other seven, rather, 
when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, the first thing I thought of, uh, I don't know why God made me a pastor, because my mind goes in weird directions when I read this. Did the four daughters urge him not to go? See? Uh, did uh, Philip urge him not to go? Well, the other eight said, let's not go. And I don't know what they're going to do with their monster servant who's protecting them and all that money they're carrying if they don't go to Jerusalem. But notice Paul's reaction in verse 13. Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. This is how committed he was to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. How committed are we to the Holy Spirit's leading in our life? And since he would not be persuaded... Luke says, we just ceased saying anything to him and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Well, see, that's what Paul was doing. He was following the Lord's will. Another reason why I take the interpretation of the last one like that. So even if the pleading of friends and co-workers as close as Timothy and Luke could not persuade Paul. We can be certain that Paul resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. He didn't have a martyr's complex. He wasn't hoping he could die for Christ so everybody would think how great he is. Who wants that to be their last sin before they step into heaven? I want everybody to think very well of me and then poof, you're standing before God. I didn't really mean that. But, no, that's, that's not what's motivating him. What is? He was eager to do the Father's will. Are we eager to do the Father's will? What would we give to do his will? What would we sacrifice to do his will? Well, Caesarea to Jerusalem the third point and the Third act. So Paul arrives in Jerusalem, verses 15 and 16. After these days, we got ready and we went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus. I know you want to pronounce that Munason. Don't. Just leave the M alone. It's actually a derivation of the name Jason. So if you want to call him Jason, that's fine. You can call him Manason if you want to. It's just weird. And an early disciple, uh, uh, Nason was an early disciple with whom Paul says we should lodge. And as I mentioned, the trip from Caesarea to Jerusalem, about 120 kilometers on foot. But there's a phrase that said they got ready. And actually... Outside of the Bible, that word is used to describe, you'll guess, maybe, putting a saddle on a horse or loading up a donkey with stuff. Maybe one of the donkeys had to carry the big hunk of a servant. He wasn't too happy. But the idea is they probably rode horses or they had some help in making it a quicker trip. And it's interesting that they... Uh, they went uh, with some believers, the text says. There were some believers there who traveled with them. Well, I mean, what believer do you think of from Caesarea? Uh, remember Cornelius, the centurion, who got saved? They had a service in his house. Peter was the one who told, or God told Peter to go there and preach to them. So maybe... Uh, Maybe Cornelius came with them to sort of pave the way, you know. Maybe if they had to go through checkpoints, you know, having a centurion with you would help. But um, Luke is still in the party. They're all going. 
Notice all the we's and us's, those first person pronouns that Luke uses when as the author he is representing himself with this group. And then verse 17 says, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. Now Paul was in Jerusalem about five years before this. He had been there just for a very quick visit uh, in about A.D., uh, end of A.D. 21, maybe the very beginning of A.D. 22, and this was sometime in the middle of the year A.D. 57. So it's been about five years or so since he's been there. Maybe he was introduced to uh, the new elders who were there in the last five years. And, I mean, we're talking about a seriously large number of elders. And we'll find out why in just a minute. Uh, maybe they prayed together, they shared a meal, they weren't uh, anxious to take care of all the business they had right away because we read uh, that they came back the next day, verse 18. On the following day, Paul went in, Luke says, with us to James. He was the senior pastor there, the senior elder, and uh, all the elders were present. After greeting them, he, Paul, related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So, I mean, think of that. The miracles in Ephesus. That would have been extraordinary. But really, to this audience, pardon me, I'm a little warm. Uh, this audience was all Jewish. And God is doing this through Gentiles? Now, Paul was not a Gentile. He was a Jew, but he was the apostle to the Gentiles. They would have thought this would be just extraordinary. Talking about the collection for the saints and how generous the Gentiles were. Uh, Paul speaks about this at length in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So he would have had some time to go through what God was doing. And when they, James and the other elders, heard this, they received it. They glorified God. Together. Verse 20. This leads us to a bit of a change here. And we're not really going to appreciate this change until next week's message. But Brother Logan told me I had to be done by 2 p.m. at the latest. So we're going to work toward that. All right. Uh, verse 20. They said to him, You see, brother. How many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. What law is he talking about? The law of Moses, the law of the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It would include Genesis as a book that Moses wrote, but the law itself didn't start until we get to Exodus. So, so they are zealous for the law. Now, estimates of the population of Jewish Christians in Jerusalem ranged from 20 to 50,000. These are the born-again Christians. 20 to 50,000. How? Thank you, brother. I was hoping somebody would get that hint. Thank you very much. Uh, imagine, imagine the influence on Edmonton there would be with 20,000 born-again believers that were not here, say, 10, 15 years ago. Ah, I mean, you think we'd have any other churches like Lighthouse here? Yes, sir, we sure would. Uh, and it might have been more than 20,000. What about 50,000? And these were, of course, divided into house churches because there was no amphitheater back then to hold that many people for each of the services. So if they had house churches, we're talking about probably somewhere around 1,000 pastors for those churches. 
And this may have been the number of elders who were there. Certainly some of them who were there. I mean, really extraordinary to think about. And it says they were being zealous for the law. This was sort of a, a rallying cry for the Jews. It was an expression popularized during the Maccabean Revolt. That revolt took place from 167 to 160 B.C., against the Greek Hellenization of the Jewish culture. In other words, laws were being passed to tell them you cannot offer sacrifices. And uh, the person who authorized that went into the temple and offered a pig on the altar of God. So, so there was a revolt led by the... Uh, uh, the leader and his sons, whose last name was Maccabee. That's why it's called the Maccabean Revolt. And they fought against this Hellenization. And they won. And there was the rallying cry, zealous for the law, zealous for the law. And now here are all these Christians. And they're zealous for the law, but those of you who've been here during this series, you remember that in the Jerusalem Council, there was this conflict between the Jewish Christians. What are we to do with these Gentile Christians? Well, if they don't follow the law, and especially, you can read about this at the very beginning of, of Acts 15, if they don't circumcise their men, they cannot be born again. They cannot be saved. So, uh, verse 21. They have been told about you. This is James or the elders as a group telling Paul, Paul, they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake the law of Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children. Now, let me stop here and just make a comment. Paul did not tell anybody to forsake the law of Moses. As a matter of fact, what was the last thing he did when he left Corinth and was coming to Jerusalem after the second missionary journey? He took a vow. He was following the Jewish law of taking a vow. And, and what did he do when he wanted Philip to travel with him? I mean, Pastor Logan read this. He was circumcised. In fact, Paul circumcised Timothy. Why? So that he could travel with them and so that they could witness to the Jews and the Jews wouldn't be offended because they all knew that his mother was a Jew even though his father was Greek. He should be circumcised. Who did this? Paul did this. He's not against the law of God. He's not telling anybody to not forsake or not circumcise their children and walk according to their customs. What then is to be done? They say in verse 22, they will certainly hear that you have come. And so the elders had gotten together and they had figured out a way to make the people who are spreading this erroneous idea about Paul by the way, what do we call that when somebody spreads an erroneous idea about you? Gossip. Does God think gossip is okay? Oh, nobody's answering? <laughs> no, no, not at all. What if what you're saying is true? Does that make it okay? No, not at all. It is wickedness. And so this is what was happening, and they wanted to overturn this without making an ethnic issue like they did at the Jerusalem Council. So, Paul never told anyone to forsake Moses. And remember, Paul circumcised Timothy so that Timothy could minister to Paul with the Jews. The only thing Paul opposed, and you'll remember this back from chapter 15, the only thing Paul opposed following, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the only thing that Paul opposed was the Jews teaching that a Gentile could not be saved unless he was circumcised. Well, I guess all the ladies could be saved, but not the men. But anyway, 
Uh, Paul opposed following the law in order to get saved. That's what he opposed. He was against that. But you know how folks are. You say one thing, they'll make it a different thing and make it sound horrible, and that's what was happening. Verse 23, we have four men, they say, who are under a vow. And they, he said, uh, they said, take these men, these four men, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. So that they may shave their heads. <laughs> wow. I can explain that too. All right, number one, the elders of the Jerusalem church had worked out a way for Paul to prove that he was loyal to the Mosaic law. And uh, there were four men there under a vow. And, you know, it's entirely possible because they probably knew that Paul was coming. Uh, what can we do so that his being here cannot be a problem? And probably they came up with this. They have four men. They started three weeks earlier taking a Nazarite vow because you have the minimum you take it for is, is four weeks. So they have a week left on it. And so uh, they say, Paul, pay the expenses for these four men having himself purified with them and pay for the ritual offerings that they have to make when they come to the end of their vow. And when they shave their heads, they've been growing their hair for those 30 days. And uh, so, so Paul does this. In fact, uh, notice their conclusion in verse 24. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, when I'm ministering to Jews, I live as a Jew. When I'm ministering to Gentiles without the Jews being there, I am, I live as a Gentile. And yet, he says, I still observe certain aspects of the law. As long as there's no confusion about what the salvation message is. And so, this settles what the Jews who have to believe should do. But what about the Gentile believers? What should they do? Well, that's what James is addressing in verses 25. Uh, in verse 25, But as for the Gentiles who have believed, and you'll remember this, we have sent a letter with our judgment that these Gentiles who are in a church with Jews should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols... They should abstain from blood, eating blood, and from what has been strangled, and in other words, has not been bled yet, uh, and from sexual immorality. You say, well, of course everybody should abstain from that. That's not what the Gentile culture taught. <laughs> not at all. Now, the Jews understood that, but not the Gentiles. And so Paul knew this because he was present at the Jerusalem council when they drafted this letter. He went with them when they took the letter to the Gentile churches. When he and Silas and Timothy went on the second missionary journey, they read the letter in all of the Gentile churches where they went. And it was very encouraging to the Gentiles. So our question is then, did Paul agree to their plan to do this? Verse 26, then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. And when the seven days were almost completed, Paul went into the temple. And this is where things changed. Now, in conclusion, I just want to remind us that the Spirit's leading is very important for the Christian. Why is that? Because Romans chapter 8 says, if we don't have the Spirit of God, we are not saved. <laughs> 
And those of us here who are born again, who are saved, we have repented of our sins and we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. Somebody asked me before I knew Christ, he said, do you believe Christ died for your sins? I said, of course, I'm a Catholic. Everybody who's a Catholic agrees that Christ died for our sins. And then he said, if you don't get saved, then it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> I'd never heard the word saved, and I didn't know I had to do anything so that it would apply to me. But I got saved, and the first thing, and I didn't know what was happening to me. In fact, I pulled the car off the road. I said, God, if, if this gospel that's been explained to me is true, then you know this is what I want. I want to follow what is true. And so I take the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And then I just looked out the windshield. I said, what were you looking for? Oh, Mary? I don't, you know, maybe another saint? Isn't an angel going to come down and be, you are mine now? No. I had no idea what I was looking for, but I thought I meant it. I really meant it. So if there's a God and he heard me, then I am saved. And off I went. And the first thing that happened that I remember is the desires of my heart changed. I did not want the sin that I had preferred to God before I got saved. I didn't want that anymore. And you say, wow, you really changed. Yeah, but I wasn't doing any of it. I wasn't doing any of it. He was. And I thought, you know, this person told me to read the book of John, so I read the book of John. I was amazed at the book of John. I tried to read it twice before, and I never got past the first 18 verses. Whoa, if it's so weird like this, I'll never understand it. But I did that night. And, and that's how salvation begins. If you are not born again, you cannot follow the leadership of the Spirit because you don't have the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, you will not go to heaven when you die. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. That doesn't make any difference. Do you know how many pretty good people are in hell right now as we have this service? No, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to his mercy in Christ. It's according to his mercy that we are saved. <clears throat> but I just want to remind those of us here who are saved about two things of following the Lord's leadership. Number one, we ought to realize that bad news does not mean God doesn't want us to do a thing. Going to a place that is dangerous or that might be dangerous does not mean God does not want me to go there. The safest place a Christian can be, we talked about this last week, the safest place a Christian can be is where? In the will of God doing what? What God wants you to do. That's the safest place in all the world. You say, well, I'm safe here. Oh, I mean, you ought to know better than that. You could be driving home and someone could just hit you head on and you would be dead and you would have no chance to turn at that point. Once you die, the opportunity is gone. So, safest place a Christian can be. And actually, I didn't come up with that. I heard a missionaries say that years and years ago and I thought boy that's really true so Lord would you lead me to a dangerous place that'd be cool no that's not what I thought and of all things God brought us to Canada uh, so uh, and, and I want us to think about this did Paul die in Jerusalem no did he die in Caesarea when he had to go there to get away from the Jews ambush no, he didn't die in Caesarea. What about on the ship on the way to Rome? They were in a terrible storm. Did he die there? No, he didn't die there. In fact, at the end of the book of Acts, is Paul still alive? Yes. 
And I wonder if those eight men and other people who urged him not to go would say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it was God's will for him to go to Jerusalem. And we already talked about one reason why God might have revealed to him the affliction was coming. But I want to I want to give you another Paul's Paul's arrest in Jerusalem provided him an unusual opportunity in chapter 21 and 22 to witness to a large crowd of Jews on the Temple Mount. That afforded him the opportunity to witness to the entire Jewish Sanhedrin with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea perhaps sitting in. It gave him the chance to witness to two Roman governors, Felix and Festus, and to a Jewish king, Agrippa, in chapter 26. And when we read Philippians 1, he not only got to witness to the household of the emperor, but perhaps even the emperor of Rome himself. And he never could have done that unless he faced that call of the will of God. So let's learn to follow the Spirit's leading. And let's make it in all the decisions we make, folks. Let's, let's pray. My wife, <laughs> she used to pray about what she should buy. She'd walk down the aisle in the grocery store. Lord, should I buy this or should I buy this? Let's learn to ask the Lord's direction in all the decisions we make. Let's learn that although every opportunity is not necessarily the Lord's leading, let's not make the mistake of thinking that a difficult situation or one that might prove dangerous is automatically not God's will. Or, parents, that that doesn't mean that God does not want your child to go. One of the commentators said this. I thought it was worth mentioning. Well-intentioned people can be wrong about what God desires. Well-intentioned people can be wrong about what God wants for you. Now, if somebody says you shouldn't do it, just remember that's what Luke said. That's what Timothy said. That's what all the folks there said. Don't do this. And let's learn also that God was very kind to let Paul know what was coming. He was gracious. Maybe he knew Paul needed that. Maybe he knew the go-forths should not be told that. But again, we go back to the beginning. What God tells me is for me to obey. And what God doesn't say, I don't need to know about unless he reveals it to me. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this portion of your word and the truth that it tells us. <clears throat> Lord, I ask that you'd make this uh, a blessing to our hearts and help us, Lord, just to lay our, our lives without any uh, hindrances or hedges or leaving out anything. May we... Lay our lives before you. Lord, they are yours. You have purchased them with the blood of your son. And we belong to you. Help us to be in earnest about following your directions for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.